This lecture is being brought to you in part by the generous gifts of these sponsors. Uh, this is my second lecture with IHMC. I spoke in uh, um, where did I speak? <laughs> just just an Alzheimer's trick. <laughs> Wanted to see if you remembered. Um, I'm here to see to it that you don't get Alzheimer's. That's my mission tonight. If you listen and you pay attention, uh, first thing that'll happen is you'll release some adrenaline. A little stressful learning situation releases adrenaline. Adrenaline causes your astrocytes to release lactate. Lactate is a fuel for learning. When you go to bed tonight, rehearse what you hear today one time, do a little weightlifting, and you'll remember everything I'm telling you. <laughs> it turns out that the fuel that has been disparaged for so many years by bodybuilders and athletic tra traders or what have you, lactate is the fuel for neuronal life. It's the fuel for your brain, the major fuel for your brain. Glucose and lactate, and then ketones. The ketones and the lactate are spare fuels to protect your brain when nutri nu nutrients are scarce and you're starving and you have to run after some animal on the Paleolithic savanna in order to survive. Isn't it curious that lactate would be such an important fuel because that's what you expend when you're hunting and gathering. So this is a metabolic profile that comes from ancient times that we have to realize and utilize today. So let's begin by, first of all, counting the fact that we have roughly 86 billion neurons in our brain. If you look across species from mice to mammals, mammoths, all, all kinds of species, longevity, is directly related to the number of neurons you have. It's also related to your body mass and your lean body mass, but that's within a species. <clears throat> Across species, the longest life species have the most neurons. The Arctic Atlant Atlanticus mollusk being an exception, it has a very small brain, but its heart beats for 500 years. Because it lives at the bottom of a cold ocean, and there's nothing to do. There's no stress, it just takes in nutrients as they come through. And then Johnny Weissmuller swims by once in a while, if you remember those old, old Esther, Esther, <laughs> Esther Williams films. I'm a film bus. I, I, I wrote a book on Hollywood and uh, did a lot of work on the statistics of the movies. So pardon me if I use these. So if we look here, we, we see the number of neurons and the species that's involved. We go from the owl monkey, which had uh, a billion, about a billion neurons. 10 billion neurons is a baboon and or orangutan. And the human has 86 billion. It's, usually they say 100 billion. But give or take, it's like government work. Give or take a few billion neurons is not a big deal. <clears throat> uh, Ken Ford, who runs this place, probably is up here at 100 billion. Smartest guy. Uh, I. I held my breath too long. As a, as a young swimmer, I tried to see how long I could stay underwater. I probably killed a few billion neurons by starving them of oxygen. Hyper, hypoperfusion is one of the main reasons your brain degenerates. Now, have a look here at the glucose utilization because glucose is a prime fuel for the brain. It's not only in terms of a source of energy, it is the substrate that makes the DNA in the neuron. It makes the membranes. It makes the, uh, the it assembles the cytoskeleton of the neuron. Structures everything in terms of a neuron. Psychiatric diseases are diseases of poor structure in the neuron. You lose neurons every time you're depressed. You lose neurons when every time you eat a, three, a triple chocolate cake Sorry. <laughs> and you may, you may lose neurons if you fast too, too stringently and too long. 
So only fast a little bit. How many of you practice fasting? Oh, well, and I know Ken Ford and I do. Uh, and we have pretty active brains. It's, it's said I'm, I'm 80 years, almost 80 years old. I'm way, way beyond that. I'm, I could be eligible for a Democratic presidential candidate, <laughs> candidacy. Now, <laughs> I have, I'm older than the oldest of those guys by a long shot. So what we want to do is to maintain our metabolic fitness. Now, Alzheimer's, I'll get into that in more detail later. But I want you to also notice the glucose figures here. Um, so uh, 100 billion, let's say you guys are, you're all smarter than I am, so you have 100 billion neurons in your brains. You should use about 600 uh, millimodes millimo of, of uh, glucose per minute. Per day, you should use 150 grams of glucose a day. That's like one chocolate cake. <laughs> I don't know. But a low-carb diet, which is, which is healthy, but if it goes below 150 um, grams of carbohydrate a day, glucose a day, is questionable in terms of the brain's metabolism. It won't have the substrate to build new, new neurons, it won't, and to repair it, keep the current neurons healthy, and it won't have enough substrate to have a healthy metabolism. When you have a memory blank or a, uh, a, bad, a bad night's dream or you have post-traumatic stress or one of these things, you actually have damaged neurons. It's, psychi psychiatric diseases are actually neuronal deficiencies, deficiencies of metabolism in the neurons. And, and the, the lucky thing is that we can correct many metabolic deficiencies just by what we eat and what we do. But if these are destined in our genes, then Alzheimer's is like a mysterious disease. It's not. The new models of Alzheimer's tell us it's not mysterious at all. And I'll get to that near the end of my lecture. So the point here is that we, our, our brains require a good deal of, uh, of glucose. The topics I'm going to address then are going to cover, first of all, how our brains evolve. Because it's very important. It turns out that the last regions of, the brains to, of our brain to develop are the ones most prone to damage. It's like the, the, the newest neighbors on the block, and they're less durable. They haven't had as much time to develop their dur durability and their flexibility. Now, the modern brain, our brain, with this 86 billion neurons, is only about 70,000 years old. That's a blink of time in evolutionary history. It is a derived from the primate brain, but it is expanded in a, in a dramatic way. About half, again, as many neurons. And also, a more prominent prefrontal cortex and longer sig signal pathways. A larger brain, isolated modules. The brain is more like a Swiss army knife. It has a module for everything. And then you have to connect those modules. So the connections are critical. And the timing of the connections is critical too because neurons that fire together learn. They tie together. So in order to learn a new skill or learn what we're talking about tonight, neurons have to fire in different regions of the brain but have to synchronize their firing. In order to synchronize their firing, something from the prefrontal cortex to signal back to the, say, the um, hippocampus is a long signal path. That has to be a heavily myelinated signal path so that the signal can go through rapidly. So myelin, which is one of the astrocytic cells in the brain that supports the brain, is a very important component. And we are still remyelinating our minds as, as we live. Myelination is an active process. You've learned that in, in if you have MS, your myelin degrades and your brains are degraded of myelin and signal in, inappropriately and have in a, in a, uh, un, ineffective uh, metabolism. So it, it leads to cellular death in the, in the brains. So myelin is one of the critical late features of brain evolution that is vulnerable and it is critical. Schizophrenics have under-myelinated brains. The signals get crossed. 
if you know one, and I, f I finally met one. He was my business partner. <laughs> you, learn, you learn under those stressful cir circumstances. He was a bipolar, depressive uh, individual, and he would sleep 18 hours a day, and I would wonder, what in the world are you doing? He was kidding over his depressive episodes. He had defective metabolism. It was inherited in his case. He was a third generation. And every defective gene transformation anticipates the next generation and comes on sooner. But your genes are not destiny. This is a point I make in my New Evolution Diet book. You can change your gene expression. And gene expression is always occurs in the context of your current let's call it the metabolic milieu. So if you have a healthy metabolism, a deficient gene expression isn't going to trouble you that much. Okay? That's like the APO phenotype, that is the type 4, epsilon 4, has a higher risk of diabetes and of Alzheimer's. It turns out that's the original form of the APO gene and they are the original hunter-gatherers. And they retain that hunter-gatherer feature now. I'm probably an APO type because I try to live like a hunter-gatherer, at least, at least I'm, I'm a fake hunter-gatherer. Uh, I forage through the world. And uh, that genotype is only at risk for Alzheimer's if you have a metabolic profile that enhances the expression of that Phenotype. Turns out you, you end up being insulin resistant, which we all are beginning, beginning to learn is one of the great banes of human existence. It's, it's curious. Our brains have created an environment that is so safe and so replete in nutrition and undemanding in terms of physical activity that we now suffer things that our ancestors never suffered. Diabetes, insulin resistance, they're the number one factors in terms of Dementia. Now, this, the point is, I'm just three years, I, I gave my last lecture three years ago. Maybe if I come back in three years, I'll be 85. I'll be at the age when half the people at that age and older have dementia. And the bulk of that dementia is Alzheimer's. And Alzheimer's is a, is a simple metabolic disease with extremely complicated molecular dynamics in terms of the what aggregates in the cells and so forth. But in order to avoid Alzheimer's, you have to start 15 years before you get it. It's irreversible, but it's preventable. Isn't that interesting? You know, it's a fatal disease. It's the number eight, it's the eighth cause of death now in, in, the, in the United States. And it's probably going to just accelerate. And your metabolism is the key. It's not some strange genetic profile you have. It's not something you did when you were young, although middle-aged obesity is one of the major predictors. <clears throat> Notice middle age, and then you lose weight, and a, tr a trait of Alzheimer's, as, you, as it begins to occur, you lose weight dramatically. You have hypermetabolism, you, you end up losing weight, and the reason is, of course, you're becoming resistant to the action of insulin and not able to use nutrients properly. You have a starving brain. That's what you have if, you have if you're developing Alzheimer's. So how does, the, how does this juvenile brain evolve? We are juvenile, juvenileized chipmunks. No, chimpanzees. Let me show you some slides. All right, we got the... So you need a minimal amount of glucose. By the way, they, they say the cancer cells tend to like, they tend to be a glycolytic type. They like to glu metabolize glucose. That's because they're proliferating rapidly. Uh, cancer is a stem cell gone bad, pro dividing rapidly, and it needs the glucose, not for the energy, but for the substrate, the stuff that makes the interior of the cell, makes the DNA, makes the lipids, makes the mem membranes. So we are neotenized apes or chimpanzees. Neoteny is the retention of juvenile features into ad advanced age. 
Okay? And it means you have the plasticity and the responsiveness of youth, but you have, you know, you're, you're a fully developed human being. Here's, here's the progression of the brain in uh, different species, the macaw and the chimpanzee. And you see in the human, it starts later, it peaks at a higher peak, and then it goes on until you're 80 or so. A neotenous brain is a brain that has young regions that continually renew themselves and learn new things. What that means is, uh, if you look at a Look at this, the center one. These are both a, a primate and a human fetus. They look identical. Here's a, a juvenileized ape and an adult ape. I know one looks like your neighbor and the other looks like, <laughs> like a modern human. We are juvenileized apes. That means we retain juvenile characteristics at an advanced age. This is, this is the development that didn't finalize until about 70,000 years ago, at the onset of the deepest stages of the Ice Age. It would have been important to develop a good brain at that time in order to survive. It's a highly variable climate, a dangerous climate. But on the other hand, <clears throat> families settled in, in sort of refuges from the Ice Ages along the South African co coast down in Pinnacle Point, Clasey's Cave, and a bunch of famous locations where they find remains of modern humans. And about 70,000 years ago, human behavior shifted in a dramatic way. They began, to sh they began to produce art. They began to bury their, their dead ceremonially. They developed language. And they had a settled, established locale where they lived. They didn't have to move so often in the, seas, the refuges at sea. They ate a lot of seafood. And a, and a female became autonomous from the male to some extent because she could gather enough protein on the seashore to sustain herself and her, ch her children. Whereas before, they're completely dependent upon males and their hunting for their protein. So there was a reduction in sexual dimorphism the male relative to the female height shrunk, shrunk, and the brain expanded. Not that much, but maybe a few billion cells, mostly located in the prefrontal uh, region, as you see in the, in the young chimpanzee. So let's talk about the, this. The, the, the y-axis is the extent of neoteny in that brain region. Now, brain regions, you've got plenty of modules in your brain, so you have lots of brain regions. <clears throat> it turns out that the, the frontal cortex is the most neotenous region of the brain. That is, it's most dependent on the metabolism of glucose. And it's the most recent area of the brain to develop. And it also has the longest connections to other, other uh, brain regions, so it depends heavily on what? Myelination. So the, the, the circuits are efficient across long distances. By the way, the myelin not only is insulation on your nerve, there are little nodes around VA along the, the myelin that are like repeaters. They speed up the signal. So a myelinated nerve will transmit a signal 100 times faster and at less energy than an unmyelinated nerve. You see how important that would be to synchronize areas of the brain. Because to learn something, regions of your brain have to synchronize. They all have to hum at the same frequency, so to speak. Which, by the way, is about 100 hertz, a little above middle C. Mm. <clears throat> so we relate to that kind of thing. And it's also the case that the, the brain is wired like a small called the small world network. Some highly connected regions have short path links to other regions because you'll have a lot of connections and then you have one that jumps across the, the network. It's like the stars in Hollywood have contracts with different actors. You know the, 
Six Worlds of Kevin Baker, Six Degrees of Kevin Baker uh, game. You're related to somebody who knows me just six degrees away. I mean, you all know Ken Block, so you, you're only one degree away. But uh, it turns out that uh, most regions of the brain have this kind of characteristic. It's called the power law statistical distribution. It means that the networks that are most highly connected tend to get more highly connected. The rich get richer. Okay, it's not a democratic brain. I don't know if it's Republican either, but it's, uh, <laughs> it's, uh, it's what we have. Uh, so the regions along here calculate almost directly to how recently they evolved their full expression. Now the hippocampus is uh, right about here. It's in the, down the lower left. This is your direction, your sense of direction and place. It creates this geometric structure inside the brain, a virtual geometric construction that you can use to find your way. And when you, can't, when you can find your way, you can also place words in sequence. Turns out the most powerful feature of the memory is that it encodes sequences and then goes backward and looks at bigger patterns and derives the sequences from the larger patterns. That's how you learn. Guess who has a, a huge hippocampus? A taxi driver in New York. <laughs> and their hippocampus grows throughout their career. So here's a region of the brain that's perfectly adaptable that you can constantly learn. With the GPS, you're never going to do this. So we've, we've, we've eliminated one source of hippocampal regener regeneration. So throw away your GPS and your cell phone and drop Twitter, and uh, it'll, it'll affect how everything works. So along the, along the bottom axis is the extent to which these brain regions depend upon glucose, glycolytic pathway. That the heaviest dependence on the glycolytic path pathway are the ventral front, frontal cortex, the dentate gyrate, gyrate region, and, you know, other regions I don't even know. Uh, okay. So down here's the amygdala. The amygdala is an ancient, the red one down there, that's the fear module in the brain. And it's not that glycolytic and it's not that recent. Animals had fear long before they became humans, right? So what you want is to realize this is all dependent on the utilization of glucose in some, some fashion. If you're if you become insulin resistant, then you, you can make the prediction already. You don't utilize glucose well, which regions are going to go first? The ones at the top. And it's going to, going to go down. It's like a last in, first out. The most recently evolved, the, the soonest to degenerate. So glucose metabolism is, um, is crucial to this uh, whole thing. So I'm going to, okay, I'm going to tell you about this, but uh, I want to warn you about the next section. So we've, we've basically covered this, except I want to mention that we, we, we trim the synapses in our, in our brain. We overproliferate the synapses early on. Teenage years are really confused years for a teenager and for the parents <laughs> because the synapses are super abundant. They haven't been trimmed yet, so you don't have these reliable circuits that have been built up. You don't have the, the neur neuronal circuits. You have a thought goes along this circuit and then it hits 100 synapses and goes every which way. That's, that's my teenager, I don't know about yours. Uh, so trimming takes place. There's an overproliferation early on followed by a trimming. A pruning of the synapses, and that goes on till your 30s. And from then on, it's all over, no. <laughs> from then on, you, you build and trim synapses as needed. And by the way, schizophrenics don't trim the synapses properly, so their thoughts go everywhere. They start off on a circuit and they end up who knows where. Depression is the same thing, it's uh, the, the circuits that are trimmed have been depleted because schizophrenics have so much 
uh, post-traumatic stress creates so much cortisol that the, the tropic signaling for the neurons is diminished. So the neurons degrade because they don't get these growth signals, these trophic signals. Trop tropic signaling is probably the key of all of this, but I don't want to put you through that right now. It's kind of sophisticated arguing. So now we have to think, all right, our brain is formed, we've trimmed our synapses, we're ready to live an adult life. Well, your brain has two purposes, to keep you alive and to help you reproduce. It's as simple as that. And because of that, it is in a hyper-attentive state all the time. The electricity is always on. So Duke Power will like that. <laughs> One of the many sponsors. Uh, the, the, the electricity is always on in the brain. It only drops to about half of its metabolism when you're sedated, when you're, under, you're going under for an operation. And at that point, you've lost consciousness. So what is consciousness? It's energetic computation based on metabolism. It's not some big, deep principle of the prefrontal cortex or anything else. It's a taxi driver who knows how to find his way. He knows himself. He can dis distinguish himself from the environment. He can map his way through the environment in a sensible way. So if you're suffering, I would, I would, I would tell people who are suffering from dementia to go get a job as a taxi driver. <laughs> they would exercise their hippocampus. Using it means you develop it. Failing to use it means you lose it. It's really quite simple. That's how the body is, because it withdraws the nootropic factors, the factors that keep the neurons alive and functional. Now, as we're, we look at brain metabolism over your lifespan, it turns out as a neonatal, a recently born infant, you got all this body fat and you got all the fat in your mother's milk, so you basically are ketogenic. You're living on ketones. Ketones are partially metabolized fatty acids that can pass through the brain blood barrier. They use the monocarboxylate -carbo transporters, same thing that lactate uses. It's like the side route to get to your brain. It doesn't have to go through insulin signaling. It comes around the corner through these monoc MCT transporters. So then you become a glycolytic juvenile. Well, why would that be? Well, you got to build you got to build, you maybe have 100 billion neurons. At that time, you got to build 76 more billion neurons. So you need glucose to do that because that's the stuff neurons are made of, the substrate that neurons are made of. And then as you mature, you become this oxidative mature brain. Heavily dependent on your mitochondria, those tricky little devils inside you that can kill you anytime they want to. They're not even your own DNA. You're trusting a stranger for your brain metabolism? Yes, you are. That's a, that's a little conflict because the mitochondrial DNA and their nuclear DNA can be in conflict at points. Mitochondrial diseases are one of the major causes of brain disorders as well, and energy dis disorders in total. It's a little, it's, a, it's a, like a mild bacterial infection, but it's feeding your energy. It's, it's waste products are your energy or your ATP. Uh, and then you become this oxidative mature brain. That means you're more dependent on your mitochondria as you get older than when you're younger and developing. At a juvenile, early juvenile life, you might use 40% of your glucose to build brain. Uh, in fact, a neonatal, maybe a year and a half, two years old, more, about 40% of its total energy is consumed by the brain not by anything else. That's why it lays around and sleeps all the time, because it's got to rebuild, the, it's got to build the brain. And your teenager sleeps a lot too, because the, the trimming of the brain and the building of re new circuits takes a tremendous amount of energy. <clears throat> so you eventually revert to a kind of new equilibrium. Now, our ancestors lived 
long lives in order to develop a large brain, or they lived a long life because they developed a, long, a large brain? Probably the latter. In order to grow a large brain to survive the, the, the uncertainty of Paleolithic life, say 74,000 years ago, right after the Toba volcanic eruption, by the way, the Toba eruption is the largest volcanic eruption in two million, the past two million years, and it created a volcanic winter right at the start of the ice ages. What a, what a beast that must have been. So you have to survive that, and a brain can help you survive. A brain can find enough calories, a good brain can find the calories to support itself and to sustain the rest of the body as well. All you need is that uh, 600 calories of glucose a day. A good brain can find that easily. All right? So what's going on here now then is the switch to oxidative metabolism that is using your mitochondria is a little bit risky. The mitochondria can make abundant energy. For example, anaerobic metabolism will only make about two AP, ATP, but glycolytic oxidative metabolism will make about 38 ATP. So obviously it seems like we're better off with oxidative metabolism. But where do all the free radicals in your body come from? They come from your mitochondria. And those little bastards, they have their own DNA. They don't care about you. If they have to do something to survive, or if they decide to commit suicide, they take the cell out with it. So you want to be wary of these people who recommend that you, you, you do things to make lots of mitochondria. You have plenty of mitochondria for most of your purposes, unless you're a marathon runner. And like Joan Rivers says, when I see one of them smiling, I'll consider it. <laughs> I know there are a few here. You'll hate me, but that's okay. <laughs> they hate me anyway. Several vegan sites have prematurely announced my death. Multiple times. One, one did it twice. It's a religion, so I'm, I'm anathema to their religion and uh, therefore exterminatable. So you switch the mitochondria to a substantial degree until you start getting mitochondrial dysfunction. And mitochondrial dysfunction comes from, by the way, the mitochondria don't just burn fats and ketones, they burn glucose and lactate and pyruvate. So they're, they're using oxy, oxygen to metabolize these products, some of which are delivered along the insulin pathway, some of which, like lactate and ketones, come along the monocarboxylic pathway. It's nice to have another pathway to use because so many people are insulin resistant now, which is one reason the ketogenic diet tends to help them, but so does the Paleolithic diet, so does my diet. If I had a dollar for every syringe that could have been mailed to me from di type 2 diabetics who gave up their insulin from following my diet, I'd have several hundred dollars at least. <laughs> it'd, be, it'd, it'd be good. I've, it's, it's easy to get, a, to get rid of your type 2 diabetes and to prevent it. And there are no happy diabetics in spite of the commercials you see. I, I use Trulicity. Uh, it's pitiful. It's a miserable disease and completely preventable. All you have to do is increase your glucose tolerance by fasting a little bit, exercising a bit, and, and eating with restraint and sense. Now, Alzheimer's is also called type 3 diabetes, diabetes of the brain. So you can see where I'm headed here in terms of uh, what, uh, what the process is that you need to undergo to uh, avoid Alzheimer's. Half the people at the age of 85, which I will be in just a few years, have dementia. Like I said, Alzheimer's is the, is the biggest component of that. There are some other diseases like frontal temporal dementia 
which is the degeneration of the frontal and temporal lobes of the cortex. That's a metabolic disease too. They can't metabolize glucose in those regions. They become resistant to glucose in those regions. Those regions die off because they don't receive survival and neurotropic factor signaling. If you hit the age of 95, <clears throat> I don't know if I'm looking forward to it or not, but uh, like Bailey Davis said, aging is not for the timid. <laughs> uh, a lot of wise, wise Joan Rivers and Betty Davis, how can you beat that? Yeah. Um, at the age of 95, your, your motor units just about are totally gone. Now, a motor unit, remember, is a neuron and a portion of the muscle fiber. At 85, half, half of the people have dementia. At 95, most people lose all their muscle, all their motor, motor units. And then the two are related because diabetes encourages the loss of motor units. And motor units signal neurons to keep them healthy. Now, insulin resistance begins in your muscles. That's a signal. They're called sentinel tissues because they're post-mitotic. They don't renew by dividing. They regenerate ner uh, new, new muscle satellite cells that migrate into the muscle and bring in new mitochondria, bring in new um, genes, bring in new proteins, create a new nucleus for creating new muscle tissue. So one of the things you want to do is to stimulate uh, stem cell uh, migration into, into muscles to rebuild them. And my exercise program does that uh, completely. So now we've got, we got synapses this, that are the plastic region of the brain, the juvenile region of the brain. And all juveniles need some kind of parent to support them. So it turns out that is, let's, let's switch to the other. The little green thing is a astrocyte. They call it astrocytes because they look like starbursts. They're a site because they're a cell. The astrocytes are like the supportive parents to the neuron. It's like an Italian family. There, <laughs> there's an uncle and an aunt and a cousin and a, and a grandparent and so forth that all contribute to nurturing the child. So children grew rather safely in the Paleolithic because they had this extended family support. And they had females who could gather protein from other sources and didn't depend on those flaky nails, males. Um, so the astrocyte picks up, this is a blood vessel, the red. Astrocytes pick up glucose and lactate from the capillaries. They metabolize it. They produce lactate that, that goes into the extracellular fluid around the neuron. The neuron picks up lactate, metabolizes that, rebuilds itself, and that's how you... You can't have a memory if you don't have lactate hitting the neuron. They take little, little chicks and they block their lactate receptors and they try to teach them a trick and they can't learn. If they give them lactate, they learn. So learning, the little stress you're under now is fueling the lactate. You're going to learn some of this, go home and work out, like I said, and you'll, you'll remember it all. A workout that produces lactate diffuses lactate all the way across your body. It diffuses over a gradient. It needs receptors, but it also can diffuse just by flowing downhill. So when, you're, when your synapsis is active, it, it, exclude, it extrudes glutamate in particular. The astrocytes pick up the glutamate. They metabolize the glucose coming through your bloodstream. They produce, uh, they produce uh, lactate. The lactate diffuses through the extracellular milieu to the neurons. These little things are, are the little bodies you see in the nerve are uh, 
mitochondria, they, they burn up the lactate to produce energy to fuel the metabolism at the synapse. The synapse is the youngest part of your brain. It's constantly reforming and retracting. You need synaptic plasticity in order to learn and in order to uh, simply recall old memories too. Now, the peripheral tissue over on the other slide is like your muscle or your liver or something else that sends, uh, there's a picture of it in the center, like I guess it's, that's your bicep you're using there. You use your bicep, you produce lactate, goes into the bloodstream. Uh, this is the cell that it comes out of. The ATP is burnt in, in a cell as lactate, and the lactate goes into the bloodstream. The glucose comes out of the bloodstream. So the cell is shredding glucose and sending out lactate, and the lactate's going to the other tissues to energize them and to renew them. That's why I work out almost every day. I want to make lactate every day. And I want to diffuse it across the blood-brain barrier, and I want to send it through the MCT transporters so I bypass the insulin pathway, although I'm very insulin sensitive. How do you know if you're insulin sensitive? Well, there's a test, but the, be the, set, the, the best thing to do, and never do this in a metabolic profile. If your doctor does a metabolic profile on you, he won't do your insulin, and he won't, uh, well, he'll, he'll do your, your glucose level sometimes. And they'll use a glucose level to sort of infer what your insulin is. But you want your insulin, your basal insulin, to be low. Because when it's low, you turn on certain genes to repair all the cells. And when it's high, you turn on growth and you renew the cells. The flux of energy and substrate comes in there and renews the cell. Now, let's go back. We talked about the evolution of the brain. It turns out that these are the various things that happen in Alzheimer's. The, the A is the Alzheimer's uh, disease, and you see certain regions of the brain. I already showed you in other terms that they're the most neotenous regions of the brain, the newest regions of the brain. So Alzheimer's is a disease, disease of regional metabolism in the brain. The regional metabolism affects the, the, the most vulnerable recent additions to the brain. Okay, here's, uh, below here is epilepsy. Epilepsy simply sets a whole brain on fire. There's too much coordination among the cells and they all start firing. If they all start firing, there's not enough energy to sustain that. So some of them die or become sclerotic. So Alzheimer's is a case of too much coordination in the brain. It fires across all regions and it hits an energy crisis and some of the cells die. So the damage of epilepsy is a loss of brain cells over a period of time as a result of overfiring and an energy shortage that depletes the nutrients in certain brains. Uh, the one on the right is um, Parkinson's. The, the, the lower right is Parkinson's. It turns out that it's also an energetic failure in certain regions of the brain. In the Pars, Pars Nigra region of the brain, where there's serotonin, the, the, the brain cells that make serotonin start to fail. So here's just another example of brain metabolism. The, the sort of hippocampus is right there. It's called the seahorse. Hippocampus is Greek for seahorse. And the hippocampal region is highly connected to all the other brain regions. It coordinates all the signals sort of pass through there. So when your hippocampus starts to fail, the coordination between brain regions start to fail. Okay? <clears throat> all right. So we'll get to my form of energy. Of, 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 um, exercise, I would tell you my anti-Alzheimer's workout, but I forgot it. <laughs> I didn't forget it. It's my church. My gym is my church. 
So let's see what can go wrong now. We've already intimated that a lot of these things can go wrong. But number one, hyper, hypo perfusion of the brain. That is lack of blood flow in brain regions. Now blood flow in the brain is very convoluted. You've got all these twisty, curving places and it's very dense in terms of cells. So hyperperfusion is a serious problem. It means the brain actually lives in a somewhat sub-oxygen environment, less than the environmental oxygen by, by a long way. So what do you think it should do in terms of metabolism? If it can't get oxygen, what should it do? Anaerobic metabolism. You've heard of that? You metabolize glucose without oxygen. That's the original form of metabolism. That's fermentation. That's making beer. <clears throat> there are enzymes there that'll do that. You could make beer in your brain, I suppose. <sighs> or it could be more fun if you just drank it. Um, so hyperperfusion is a serious aspect of it. So you have to have good circulation if you get dehydrated, you have less blood volume, you eat more easily subject to hypoperfusion. Runners, one reason they're, they're, they're reasonably healthy is uh, they have high blood volume. High blood volume means your brain doesn't lack blood in critical regions. So you want a good strong heartbeat, you want to do, do things in exercise, that increase your ability to perfuse your brain with blood. The other thing is hypometabolism, under-metabolism in the brain. That means that brain region is what? Resistant to insulin. It's resistant to growth factors. The neurotropic factors that would keep that brain cell alive and healthy are lacking. That means insulin, IGF-1, insulin-like growth factor one and two, it means brain-derived neurotropic factor, glial-derived neurotropic factor, a host of growth-like factors that really, at this time, you, since you're done growing, they maintain the health of the brain tissue. So you have to have uh, good metabolism. That means insulin resistant, resistance, obesity, inflammation, and sarcopenia. You know what sarcopenia is? It's a poverty of muscle. The sarcomere is the muscle cell. Sarcopenia is poverty of muscle cells. I had the same muscle mass I had when I graduated from high school. 20, 84, uh, some, some number of years ago, 1955. <clears throat> Maybe true. In fact, it's not, it's not hard, but you, you can't be underactive. Hypometabolism comes from hypoactivity. And you lose those motor, uni motor units I talked about. Um, so there's an energy cost of learning, and there's an energy cost of synaptic plasticity. When a neuron dies, it first loses its synapses. It's like a, tr like a tree dying. The roots die back. The synapses look like these dendritic fibers that come out of the neuron. They die back. There's a withdrawal of neurotropic signaling. The, transported back to the neuron body, the cell body, and it dies. It just withers away because nobody's using it. It's like social isolation. A person socially isolated starts to wither away. The same thing that happens to neurons. When they're isolated and not utilized, they wither away. So social isolation of the brain is a cause of uh, neuronal loss. And it's true of um, human loss, too. So you need energy for two things. You need energy at a basal energy level, just at base. That's your mitochondria. But if you have some intense learning environment, like this one, you will need fast energy. The mitochondria are slow in, in terms of producing energy. You have to metabolize it, it has to flow in from the stomach through the blood stream and so forth. So you need glycolytic, you need glucose, you need to burn glucose. And the glucose is in the astrocyte in the form of glycogen. You store 
emergency fuel supplies and your astrocytes. It's like your parent, parents help you out when you don't have lunch money. The astrocytes supply that food to the neuron and keep it alive. Energy spikes are part of the intrinsic metabolism of learning. After the humming takes place, 100 megahertz, 100 hertz, megahertz, or a thousand times that, um, there has to be a spike. The spike can only be provided by glycolytic metabolism. And it turns out your neurons have not that many mitochondria because they're dangerous. You don't want mitochondria can oxidize the neuron. Um, so you have few mitochondria and they track up and down the axon from the, ner from the nerve body down to the synapses and back. And they only live about seven days, the mitochondria, and they have to be transported. One of the problems with Alzheimer's is that the traffic builds up on that network. It's like this freeway out here. The flow slows down. The mitochondria at the synapses are aged and energetically deficient. They can't signal across the synapse properly. And remember, the synapse releases these neurotransmitters that have to be taken back up. One of those is amylin. Amylin is secreted every time you have insulin hitting the cell. Amylin is the basis for amyloid. The amyloid beta sheets that form that cause Alzheimer's, that are at least a symptom of Alzheimer's. So here you see insulin tied in with amylin, tied in with Alzheimer's. There are three things your pancreatic cells release. The beta cells release insulin. The alpha cells release glucagon, which counter insulin, cause your liver to release glucose. And one of the cells in there releases amylin. Diabetics who inject in the same site for a long period of time have amylin buildup in the injection site. Amylin is, is good, but it has to be degraded properly, and that's energetically costly. So if you have an energy deficiency, you don't degrade amylin pr properly, that becomes amyloid precursor, that forms beta sheets that enclose portions of the cell, and you get these cross-linked cross beta sheets of amyloid that block metabolism. But they're not actually the real cause. The new model of, amyl of Alzheimer's is that it's the, it's the peptides that are precursors to the buildup of the amyloid sheets that cause the amyloid sheets that cause Alzheimer's. But then there are two other models as well, including my model, which I'll tell you pretty soon, not that I'm in any position to be modeling. But the thing is, that we'll go, when you sleep, this, this favorite gene of mine, Homer, comes out, makes you smarter. Can you imagine a gene named Homer that makes you smarter? <laughs> it comes out and it stabilizes the synapses after they've reformed at night during the learning period. And the ARC gene is called activity-related cytoskeleton gene. That means it's a gene that changes the actual cytoskeleton in the cell. The cytoskeleton is all these actin, actin filaments that hold the cell in, in tension and keep its shape. And it makes the, it stabilizes the synapses that you've newly formed. So uh, we can go over the, forget about the mitochondria. Here's, here's the thing about mitochondria you need to remember. Runners don't, aren't a model of healthy living. They love their mitochondria. But I hate my mitochondria. I just only tolerate the minimum amount of mitochondria that I need to have sufficient energy because I'm relying on anaerobic metabolism and I use my fast twitch muscle fiber instead of my oxidative muscle fiber. If you have mitochondria, within a few decades, they're gonna be mutated. And then the mutated mitochondria has a proliferative advantage over the the wild type. You want wild type mitochondria. They're the original ones you got from your mother. They all come from the mother, which is why males die sooner than females. They're living on, their, on a female mitochondria. Uh, there's a mismatch. I, I, I say it in a lighthearted way, but it, it's true. So I have the mitochondria that I need to tolerate 
because the, the mutated mitochondria have, have a proliferative advantage over the wild type. And if you make lots of new mitochondria, they're going to be mutated. And they're going to have energy deficiencies. They're going to make the wrong, they're going to acetylate the wrong proteins. They're going to do a lot of things that aren't essentially good for you. Which is why fasting is good, because you eat up your mitochondria. You renew your mitochondria. A little fasting, exercise is a terrific way to stress the mitochondria. Remember, a mitochondria doesn't have to survive and be a great mitochondria. It just has to be better than the other ones. It's like I can run faster than you, so the wolf will get you instead of me. You don't have to be the fastest runner, just faster than the slowest person. Well, there's a competition inside the cell amongst the mitochondria. And the mitochondria get marked by a gene called Parkin, which is involved in Parkinson's disease, by the way. And they're tagged for elimination. But how many tags do you need before you're eliminated? Well, you need some stress. So if you stress your mitochondria, you're going to eliminate the weak ones and produce the and allow the, the strong ones to replicate. And the, the, the mutated mitochondria tend to have a proliferative advantage because their DNA is missing. This is a circular DNA, and if there are 200 bit pieces missing from that, it can re replicate more quickly. So I think it's just about time for me to clear up. So here's... I think I remember my workout. Let's talk about sweet aging. How can aging be sweet? Well, you can be sweet if, if you correct your glucose metabolism. Glucose is sweet. Lactate is a carbohydrate that's related to glucose. It's a byproduct of glucose metabolism. So what we want to do is we want to... Uh, we want to stimulate alternative pathways to the insulin pathway for our metabolism. Now, the people who are on ketogenic diets, I'm in ketogenic, ketogenesis almost every day because I only eat twice a day. So between meals, I am ketogenic. When I exercise, I'm ketogenic, but I don't take ketogenic su supplements and I don't eat a lot of fat because I want to retain my insulin sensitivity. And to me, the evidence is that if you eat a lot of fat, you become relatively insulin insensitive because you, you use other pathways. But you don't produce the substrate that you need to regenerate nerves because fats don't carry those. Oh, some ketones carry a little bit of substrate, carbon, that the, that the neuron could use. But I have no argument with keto. I'm in ketosis all, most of the time, but I never measure. I had to measure my son's ketones so many years of his being a diabetic, and it got me nowhere. And I can't stand to even think about measuring my ketones now. I have a son who was type, type 1 diabetic at the age of uh, 2, which is why I learned all this stuff, because I had to keep him alive. Uh, so what do I do to work out? I want to stimulate regions of my brain, so I want to do complex exercise that challenges the brain. Why? The complexity triggers the release of noradrenaline. Noradrenaline triggers the release of lactate from the astrocytes. The brain cells and neurons are ready to learn. They have the energy substrate to learn and to rebuild new synapses. And Homer will come out at night to straighten all that out. So, what a new, I, I, for a while I was calling it the beta gene, but uh, I don't have to do that anymore. Genes that dumb down the brain don't, uh, don't seem to uh, be that important. Homer actually scales down the metabolism of the brain in regions so as to have the, the regions match one another. If you learn something new, and this module is very active, it's going to overwhelm the other. It's going to degrade the other elements of the gene networks. So you need to scale it down so that it's in a relative position to participate 
but not dominate. And Homer does that at night. <clears throat> um, so what do I do? I, I want to be insulin sensitive. My insulin is at the bottom of the range of the lab. Basal. When I have a meal, my insulin jumps up. I stimulate protein synthesis, and I eat a lot of protein. When you get older, you need a lot of protein, much more than the dietary guidelines tell you. I eat a lot of seafood. I, eat a lot, I have a lot of omega-3 oils. But by the way, if you eat salmon too many days a week, you're going to lose membranes in the brain because it has too many polyunsaturated fats to stabilize brain membranes. A parrot, the long, one of the longest live birds known to exist, birds are very smart too, they have great brains, but they have a lot of cholesterol and a lot of high density lipoproteins in their membranes. They don't oxidize easily. So they maintain membrane integrity. And membranes are not just simple things to enclose cells and materials. They're active participants in everything the cell does. So I work out in a fasted state. That means I had breakfast and I work out four hours later. I go almost every day because I like to see the people in the gym. I have a small social circle now that I'm not working and connected across the world. I quit, I dropped off the internet. Best thing I ever did. <clears throat> and uh, I, enjoy, I enjoy the gym. I don't, I don't talk much. I work out very rapidly, very intensely. And I'm out of the gym in no time. But what I do is I mostly work my fast twitch muscle fibers. Now I have a nice slide for this. Uh, what you see here is uh, some cells. Muscle cells, basically. You have quiescent satellite cells over there. They're quiescent waiting for a signal to come in and re regenerate brain, uh, brain or muscle tissue. Remember, muscle is post-mitotic. It no longer divides and multiplies. It relies on stem cells to renew it, just like the brain. Muscle and brain are very similar from that point of view. They're both post-mitotic tissues. So when I work out, I'm generating a mechanical stress on the, on the cells. That is, it's pulling against the adhesion in, in the cell membrane. And I'm particularly pulling the titan protein out. Titan is the longest protein in, in the muscle. And it, when it's stretched to its full length, it becomes a, like a spring. So I, I go out like that and then I spring back. And I release very slowly, so I do negatives. Negatives are where you lower the, rate, the weight under stress. It's far more complex to the brain to do that than it is just to push the weight up. So I might work on a machine and push it up with two arms and then lower it mostly on one arm and then up and then mostly lower it on the other arm. And I keep that up until I make lots of lactate. What's the lactate gonna do? It's gonna perfuse out of the muscle cell the fast twitch muscle fiber and it's go to the slow, slow twitch muscle fiber. It's gonna fuel the slower muscles from the faster muscle. And then from that point, it'll pass through the brain blood barrier into my brain. You can imagine a hunter-gatherer starving, so they're in ketosis, and they require fast, rapid action in order to find prey. So the, the hunter-gatherer out there on that, not a, the savanna model's a little bit old. It's no, no longer the savanna. I mean, we think we grew in a lake, a lakeshore environment. Instead, humans evolved in a place in Nambia where a giant lake used to be. And then they moved to the seashore during the Ice Age for um, shelter from, uh, from the cold. So what you're doing is you're, you're flooding the slow twitch muscle fibers from the lactate made by the fast twitch muscle fibers. And you're fueling your brain with the lactate you're making. And you're also in ketosis. Ketosis and lactate metabolism go across a different pathway. Like I say, these MCT neurotransmitter uh, transmission channels. So lactate turns out as a signal for your stem cells to proliferate. This is the holy grail. Improves your brain function, 
improves your brain metabolism, keeps your brain healthy, and rebuilds muscles at the same time. And then, time. Okay, the hook is coming. <laughs> Here are all the factors that you make with that, but I'll, I'll leave you with, there's the shuttle, there's, uh, here's one I want to leave you with. Here's neurogenesis in a 68-year-old man. See the red zones? Those are new cells, new nerve cells being created. He's one of my trainees. He does my evolutionary fitness needs. He's not, but uh, that would be me. Uh, neurogenesis is a path to brain repair. And then here's, we can all have hope. <laughs> Jellyfish has been here 650 million years without a brain. All right. Thank you. Can you give us an example of your little fasting pattern? Sure. Random. Because you have Bayesian genes who are predicting the future, and if you get it to on a routine, you won't surprise them. They need to learn, so you need novelty. Uh, two meals a day, typically, and that was a pattern in medieval times. We're, we're the only species who's trying to live in three or four meals and three snacks a day. That's not working. Human longevity has declined by four months in the last two years. Partly the opioid crisis, but partly, you know, bad metabolism. Yes? I have it. Thank you so much for your information. I'm a master swimmer, and I'm wondering how I can apply the fast twitch um, lactate generating stuff to my swimming. Yeah. Well, um, not bad, because mostly you have uh, positive movements in swimming. You're stroking and pulling, so you don't have resistance. In fact, you don't want to flow smoothly through the water. So there's not much there except to, uh, there's, there's no eccentric movement I can think of there. A runner would have eccentric movement. Every impact is an eccentric movement. That's the benefit of running. It's pounding on the ground. You stimulate twice as many stem cells if you run downhill than if you run uphill. So you could sprint, which goes over the threshold and brings the fast twitch muscle fibers in. Periodic sprinting would be the best, best way to do that. I was a swimmer too. That's how I killed all those brain cells. <laughs> Holding <Sorry>. my breath <laughs> for have, so long. We have time for one more. Your last slide stimulated me. What about this Prevagen from Jellyfish ad that we hear all the time? Debunk that. That's got to be a bunch of crap, right? It's got to be, because it has no brain. <laughs> How could Prevagen, you know, they say it supports the brain. Well, the brain of Jellyfish lost its brain. It just floats around, like, like a lot of us do. It just aimlessly floats around. Let's thank our speaker one more time. Thank you.